Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, it's Sean, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. When you think of Harley Davidson, do you think of a bike company? Harley Davidson doesn't think so. They do sell bikes as you'd expect, but their greatest asset is the Harley Owners Group, better known as HOG. HOG members typically spend 30% more than other Harley owners on such items as clothing and Harley Davidson sponsored events. And this kind of membership? This is precisely what most enduring organizations understand and use. Whether you look at a football club, a book club, or a religion, they all make sure they're working really hard to create a membership site. And it's easy to get swayed and believe that a membership site is built one way and not the other. In this series, we'll look at three membership sites, well, three types of membership sites, and then we'll look at something which is not a membership site at all. And we'll split it up into two podcast episodes so you can absorb it without it hitting you all at once. But what are we going to cover in these two episodes? The four types of membership sites are, one, a handheld membership site. Second, a content-driven membership site. Third, a time-limited membership site. And the fourth is not a membership site at all. But let's start out with the first one, which is a handheld membership site. Which is the second most popular search engine on the internet? It's YouTube, of course. If you want to learn how to start up your Tesla or hammer a nail on the wall, or just learn how to do a yoga pose, it's all there on YouTube which theoretically means that there's more than enough descriptive content on YouTube to solve most how-to problems. And yet, as most of us have found out, learning something is relatively easy until we have to apply the concept. And that's not the only place that we get stuck. If you were to consider learning as a road, we'd get stuck almost every few meters and sometimes get so very frustrated that we start to embrace a belief system. And in that belief system, we see others who are smarter than us, others who are more talented than us. Or we just start to believe that we're hopeless at something, which is precisely where a handheld membership site comes into play. A handheld membership site is exactly as it sounds. You're playing mama or papa bear and the baby bears need guidance. Now, unlike YouTube, which simply gives you a solution, the handheld membership site would be designed to give you a precise answer. So let's say it's a membership site that's about copywriting. It's more than likely that the members who join the site will spend most of their time around how do I start up my copywriting business or how much do I change in my text or where do I get the best resources for copywriting? Some of these questions will recur, and if you're running a handheld membership site, then you've taken on the role of helping and mentoring your clients through different phases of their copywriting career. This kind of website is how the 5000 BC website was built, except that 5000 BC is not restricted to just copywriting, but it has all types of discussions, all types of information on a bunch of varied topics. On any given day, you may have questions about web design, confidence issues, starting up, pricing, pre-sale, and yes, also copywriting. In order to run such a website, you're going to have to be around a lot of the time. But it doesn't have to be all of the time. When we started out at 5000 BC, we simultaneously decided to take three months off. Not three months at one go, 
like 12 weeks of work and then a month off. And if you're spending a lot of time on the website and you're helping clients, you can't go from 100 miles an hour to zero in one day. And so I'd peek into the membership site and I'd see if there was anything urgent or important or something that I could answer. And that's when a client of ours, Paul Wolf, told me to stay away. We are trying to do something similar to what you're doing, he said. And if you come into work on vacation, you're defeating the purpose, which is approximately what you can do even if you run a handheld website. Despite clients needing answers all year round, there are times when you can simply step off and take a break. Doesn't this vacation bit cause a bit of a disruption? Every membership site is run in a different way. But at 5000 BC, we asked the members to pitch in. The forum is called The Cave, and we call for cave elves. It might not surprise you to know that if you're helping out almost throughout the year, clients are more than happy to pitch in when you're not around. And because clients are in different stages of their career, almost all types of questions can be answered even as you, the owner, are guzzling down a chilled beer in the hot sun somewhere. And the reality is that, at first, I didn't think that you could just leave a site and let other people run it. But that's precisely how we started up the site, because I used to be a member of several membership sites when we were starting out, and even now, but more so when we started out. And what I found was that often the owners of the website would start it up and then disappear, and then the website would continue for years on end. So even when they were disappearing, even when they were not around, it was still running, and there was very good advice. Because a lot of people online are creepy, are not so smart, but there are also and equally so, a lot of people who are exceptionally smart and who pitch in and help. And with 5000 BC at least, there are people who do courses with us, there are people who come to workshops, there are people who have done consulting. And it's not that hard to make a leap once you have trained a bunch of people, even through courses or other methods, for them to help others. And by this point, you're probably asking, if all of this kind of works by itself, then why have a handheld website at all? Now, a ship will sail for a while, even without a captain, but almost all enterprises, they need some kind of leadership. There is a myth that you can just set something up on the internet and then walk away, and that is not true at all. No matter what kind of membership site you set up, you or someone else will need to be around to be the mentor, to be the guide and the leader. And yes, a handheld website is indeed a lot of work. At 5000 BC, there may be as many as 10 to 20 questions a day. Sometimes they exceed 150. So if you're thinking of setting up a website of this nature, even 20 questions might seem mind-boggling. However, it's only scary when you see it as work. A question from a client is probably the most valuable insight you can get as a business owner. It allows you to see the world as the client sees it, and it allows you to detect trends in your marketplace long before any data-based firm can do so. This is why we're able to create podcasts, courses, and training that have consistently been in demand. However, that's only one side of the coin. The other big problem for a lot of entrepreneurs is how to create content. If you look online, you're likely to run into the same insipid articles, like 20 ways to do this, or 15 ways to do that, or you won't believe what 0.5 has. So all of this stuff is a struggle, this content creation, because they don't have questions. And when you have a handheld website, you get questions that you're not expecting. As clients start implementing your advice, they get stuck. And this leads to a question. And when you answer that question, you have an article. 
This very article, this episode that you're listening to, is a response to a question about membership sites. Instead of trying to work out what articles am I going to write, what content am I going to create for my presentation, what am I going to do for my webinar, all you have to do is look at the website itself, your own website, and you'll have questions popping in your face all day long. And sometimes you just give short, precise answers, and sometimes you go into a lot of depth. If you sit down and you write the answer systematically over a couple of days or even a couple of weeks, you've created a series. And that series can be used in articles, as a booklet, or finally become something more substantial, like even a course. And while we're looking at all of these wonderful things that a handheld website does, there's also the downside. The hardest kind of website to run is definitely a handheld website. When we started 5000 BC in 2003, we had some times when it seemed pretty viable to shut down the entire site. There would be little or no activity. I'd get demoralized and I'd moan to my wife, Renuka, that we needed to just put our energy elsewhere. And she'd gently remind me, that the website was useful for all of the reasons that we've been talking about above. But it's also important to have a small group of people, and those people are interested in your business, they're interested in their business, they're interested in having that community feeling, and that's pretty much what has sustained our business over the years. Our membership site has been around since 2003. You'd think that we have thousands of members. We don't. We have 500 members because people come and go. And we don't do any advertising. We don't do any joint ventures. We don't do any massive promotions. And so it's been more or less constant at around 500 members. And that's the core that has stayed. It's not too much of an exaggeration to say that 500 clients provide us with close to 90% of our income. It's allowed us to live a very comfortable life and mostly to do what we want to do without depending on any external sources or even to do a lot of external marketing at all. Having said all that, a handheld website requires you to be around almost all the time and that might not be your cup of cocoa. Which takes us to the second type of website, which is the content-driven website. Let's find out how that's done. In December 2017, the Vending Machine Manufacturers Association of Japan made a startling comment. There is a vending machine for every 23 people in Japan, which is to say that you're likely to find vending machines on the pavement in car parks or just about anywhere else. Like most vending machines worldwide, you can get items like drinks or snacks, but Japan's vending machines have an assortment of items that are almost too bizarre to imagine. Eggs, balls of lettuce, canned bread, homemade curried rice, Sushi socks, which is real socks rolled up like sushi, wigs for dogs, pizza, surgical masks, business cards printed for you, and even 10 kilos or 10 kilo bags of rice. In short, the Japanese vending machine is pretty much a get-it-yourself bonanza. Content-driven membership sites can also be very much like the Japanese vending machines. Take a site like lynda.com. Started by Bruce Heaven and Linda Weinman, it was built more out of necessity than desire. Linda and Bruce, they're friends of mine, that's why I'm calling them by their first name. So Linda and Bruce, they had a small training center in a tiny town in California. And the courses were prospering. Students came from everywhere, including abroad, to learn software at this institute. And then 9-11 occurred, and their business dried up almost overnight. They scrambled to put up a website, they looked up the domain name, and yes, lynda.com was available, and so they took it. 
and then they proceeded to build what you'd call a content-driven website. If you look around today, there is almost no shortage of content-driven websites. And a content-driven website is where you store content and the client pops in pretty much like a vending machine and picks what they need, which means that you're likely to find a website filled with PDF drawings of cars or another website which has video and teaches you how to code in HTML or how to paint with watercolors or even others where you can download audiobooks or different kinds of websites. Whether it's audio or text or video, the content website and the Japanese vending machine analogy, it fits amazingly well. Lynda.com stuck primarily to video. The internet was still gasping for bandwidth with dial-up modems back then, but just as Linda and Bruce started up, faster broadband came to be available. And with a combination of well-compressed videos and speedier connections, they were able to offer video to anyone who was willing to pay the membership fee. What marked their site as slightly different was that they didn't create all the content, but got others to pitch in, offering them a share of the revenue. Yet, there's a remarkable difference between a handheld website and a content-driven one. A content-driven website like masterclass.com, udemy.com, domestica.org, and yes, lynda.com, they have a lot of information and you can access all of this day or night. Many of them, or even most of them, allow you to download the learning to your devices so you can learn offline or anywhere. Yet the difference between the two is the difference between a vending machine and a restaurant. The business owner and the staff of a well-run restaurant can create deeply personal relationships and create these bonds that make their audience feel special. And it's such a relationship that fills in a gap of one of the biggest problems on the internet. Whether it's a business owner, a student, or a car enthusiast, people feel the need to interact with people. In the desire to create a vending machine sort of experience, it's easy to overlook one of the greatest problems of the internet, namely, that people are lonely. With all the information at their beck and call, they still feel the need to get in touch with others. These others may be other people who have set up a website, who have relevant experience in that field, or it may just be others like them. Which is why a car enthusiast might be more than excited to meet up with other car enthusiasts. And then that feeling of loneliness of just being by yourself, with your device, in your house, well, that kind of slightly goes away. Because now you're part of a community, and that's what a handheld system is all about. Again, the handheld system is a much harder option. And that's because at some level you're a leader of a group. When we started 5000 BC back in 2003, things went well for a while. We had a small group of clients who were interested in learning more about the brain audit. And then they'd show up in the forum, they'd ask questions, and it was all hunky-dory at the start. But a year later, by 2004, 50% had dropped off, even though the annual price of the membership was just $11 for the entire year. That's not $11 for a month, $11 for the whole year. And as I mentioned earlier, I'd be so disheartened by the lack of response in the forums that I made all sorts of desperate attempts. I'd invented a character that asked questions. That didn't go well because the other character sounded too much like me. I offered the members a reward if they asked or answered questions, and they saw that as a bribe. They told me off. And there were times when I just didn't know what to do. 
as always, we go for a walk. We've been doing so for 15, 20 years. And there are times when that lack of activity, as I mentioned earlier, would just drive me around the bend. I would despair at the lack of participation. And at least a dozen times, I just wanted to say sayonara. Lack of activity isn't the only problem. Too much can also be quite the bother. Client posts a lot of questions and keeping on top of questions can be quite demanding and it takes up several hours in the day. However, over time, we got the community to interact with each other and now 5000 BC is a vibrant, safe space for people that feel less lonely, but also they feel like they can ask these questions what seem like either small questions or big questions or silly questions or beginner questions, but they feel safe enough. They don't feel intimidated like they would elsewhere on the internet. All of this means that you've got a lot of hard work. The reality is that you can't shirk the hard work. The reality is that any community is a lot of hard work. Whether you look at a website like masterclass.com which is a solely content-driven website, or a website like 5000 BC, the workload is remarkably similar. You still have to populate it with your own content. You have to populate it with someone else's content. And while a site like 5000 BC takes up a lot of time in hand-holding, a site that's giving you only content is like a vending machine. And that vending machine has to be filled up with stuff with content and people have to be got in touch with and you have to shoot videos. Essentially what I'm saying is that if you think I'm just going to set up something and then I'm going to walk away from it, well, that's a myth that's been perpetuated on the internet that everything works by itself and there is nothing that works by itself. Even when lynda.com started, the thrust was to get libraries, universities, and various organizations to sign in. Which is to say that if you start up a membership site, then you've got to keep it going. You have to add stuff, you have to fix stuff. And yet, it's rewarding because you've built a community and you help a lot of people learn and you help them achieve their goals. Which brings us somewhat to the end of this podcast, this part one of this podcast. And if you were to ask me, well, which one would you choose? Obviously, you had two options. Now this is like, which one are you going to choose? My choice would be the handheld website for several reasons. And let me just summarize kind of what we've covered so far. So we started out with the handheld membership site, and then we went on to the content-driven membership site. And the content-driven membership site just seems like this really tempting thing. You just put the content there and people just take it away. But I think the handheld membership site is superior, even if you have fewer people, because you're creating a community that kind of knows each other and works with each other. And yes, it changes over time. People leave and other people come in. But you're creating that core community and... You get questions which enable you to create content or to get content created for your website. You get a much better understanding of what people want. And yes, it can be draining to sit there for several hours, but it's not like a content-driven website just runs by itself. You still have to do advertising. You still have to do marketing. You still have to put in the content. You're running a business. This is the same thing as any work environment. You've got to do the work. And the work doesn't stop. It's now 2020. We started in 2003. It keeps going and going and going like an energizer bunny or a Japanese vending machine. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. But before we go, here's a little teaser. There might be a situation where you don't have to build a handheld website or a content-driven website. 
And this is the third option, which is the time limited membership site. Something that starts and then stops. Something that earns a decent or even a substantial revenue. In some cases, it can even exceed the revenue of a regular membership site. And it doesn't have to last forever. It can just last for a few months and then close down. We'll find out all of that in the third installment of this series. Right now, let's find out what's happening in Psychotactics Land. So here we are, last couple of months, well, Christmas will show up sooner than later. So last couple of months of the year, what's happening? Well, there's only one thing that's happening from now to Ho 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 Day, and that is the pre-sale course, which is on the 21st of November. You have to go to psychotactics.com slash pre-sell. So that's psychotactics.com slash pre-sell. And there is a waiting list. We sell only 25 copies of the product. It's a digital product, a digital course. You can download it. And you'll probably ask why pre-sell? What's the big deal about pre-sell? The reason for pre-sale is because customers buy before they pay. And while you're wrapping your head around that sentence, it's logical, isn't it? You buy into something in your head before you end up paying for it. And what pre-sale does is it gets your customer in a frame of mind to buy something at a date somewhere in the future. So if you look at an event like Wimbledon or you look at a rock concert or anything of that nature or even a wedding and you'll notice that everyone shows up on the same date at the same time and you know there is a sense of urgency a sense of scarcity and how do you create that when you don't have a huge brand when you're pretty much nobody in the pre-sale book itself there is an opening chapter on joseph pilates and you know how well pilates is known today but at one point in time pilates was just like you and me no one knew of him how did he create a pre-sale for his service because you can create pre-sale for your services, or you can create it for training or for products, info products, things like courses or webinars. And getting everybody there is how we've kind of run our business. We waste very little time on marketing itself. We don't do any advertising. We don't do all that hoopla that you see. And the reason for that is because we get people ready to buy before they pay. And how do you go through that process? It's not a funnel. It's not some weird thing. You'll find out for yourself. Go to psychotactics.com slash pre-sell. And that's it from Psychotactics Land. It's now 5.28 a.m. in the morning. I'll say bye for now. Bye-bye. So why is 5.28 a.m. so important? As you probably are aware, I'm at work early, 4 a.m. I wake up, I get some hot water and lemon, drink that, then do some meditation and learn a bit of Spanish, just five words a day minimum, and then probably more than that. But if you're listening into this podcast, you can probably hear a helicopter hovering overhead. See, can you hear it? Well, you probably can. <laughs> At four o'clock, there is this helicopter that's hovering. Not every day, but invariably on the days I'm recording the podcast, which is random, but still, it'll show up. And then I have to stop all the time until it kind of disappears and then it comes around again. And so that's the sound from four o'clock to 6 a.m. And then at seven o'clock or so, they're building like eight or nine houses next door and they hammer away all day long from seven in the morning to 6 p.m. at night. And I have this very small window of opportunity where I can record the podcast, which is way early in the morning. And so that's why 528 is so important. Well, not precisely 528, but well, now I'm done at 530 as a helicopter reapproaches. I'll say bye for now. I'll see you in 5000 BC. And 
Thank you for listening to the podcast. Bye-bye.